All righty. So, real quick, do you go by Gooperman or Church or either? What? Uh, uh, either is fine. I think most people will call me Church in the community. Okay. Gotcha. Or uh, Goops is another one. Goops. Uh, can you can you elaborate on the name change? Uh, yeah. So originally, my my uh, name was Church Neo with the N E O H at the end. Uh, uh-huh. Church is my last name actually, and then oh. uh, N E O H is uh, stands for Northeastern Ohio, which is oh. where I was was living at. So, as far as why I wanted to change. Uh, I felt like it was kind of just like a mouthful <laughs> to say a church new, and it didn't really like roll off the tongue very well. I get you. Okay. So, yeah, but Cooperman was the better <laughs> choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of my friends and I were just kind of hanging out and uh, watching like some fighting game footage or whatever. And for some reason, he decided to say, That's Goopin. <laughs> and I was like, What does that even mean, man? <laughs> and then, uh, and then I was thinking to myself of like how I could kind of turn it into into like a a tag or something like that. And mm-hmm. I was like, "Hey, why don't we take like Superman and just make it Goopy?" Gooperman. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Gooperman. Okay, okay. I yeah, I, most people call me Church anyway because that's kind of just like even in my like everyday life. People just call me Church instead of my first name. I get you. I get you. It's a good name. Yeah. I feel like there's a couple of characters like in fiction, like Red versus Blue comes to mind, right? One of the characters' name is Church. Yeah. So I don't know. It's a good nickname. Do you want? Do real quick. Do you want me to strike that from the record from your it being your last name? Oh no, that's fine. My my last name's everywhere. Okay, just making sure. Just making sure. Not trying to dox anybody out here. Yeah, no, if someone wanted to find out like my name, they could do so very, very easily. <laughs> I get you. I get you. All right. So I, I thought maybe we could walk through history a little bit, and uh, you can sort of t- talk to me every step of the way what we're doing. So, okay. um, you, f- I think you first started doing some runs in like 2017 on the old game, right? Correct. Yeah, the very, very end of 2017. Okay. Uh, what was it like? I guess what is that? What, what what was your first speed game, and how did you first get involved with Shadow of the Colossus? Uh, so actually, my first speed game was Shadow of the Colossus, and mm-hmm. I kind of got into it uh, because I watched uh, Plush's GDQ run from I think it was either that year or the year prior at SGDQ, mm-hmm. and I didn't actually have a PS3 at the time, so I couldn't run the game. So all I could do was just kind of watch his streams and kind of pick stuff up from there and then i actually had a roommate whose sister had a ps3 that she wasn't using so i just borrowed that and then started playing the game nice okay you mentioned plush can you tell me about plush yeah plush is probably i would say probably the most legendary like north american player uh I think he's from Canada, but yeah, he he's like the the first one to really like put in like a lot of time and effort into the boss rush category. And it clearly showed because he had the top spot for a long time. Uh, I think actually he had the top spot on the on the uh, speedrun.com leaderboards. Mm-hmm. Uh, there I think there was like one or two runners who might have had a faster time, but from japan and but he was like probably the best na runner i'd say okay did we know about those japanese runners at the time or was that yeah. something like later on okay yeah plush plush knew about them uh he actually on his twitch channel at the time he had like a that big leaderboard mm-hmm. and uh, i think sheer upon it always had him beat by just a little bit but yeah he definitely knew about the japanese runners Mm-hmm. Do you know much about Shirapon? <laughs> I know that he is like probably the greatest player to ever <laughs> touch the game. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he started with the individual levels 
really, really early on. I, I don't know exactly like what year, but I would assume it's probably within the first couple of years of the game's release. Mm-hmm. And he put a lot of time and effort into learning the individual levels and kind of refining them and uh, taking the records. And then he started to move on to other categories. Like I know he did have the any percent world record in the PS3 version uh, for a while. And he also had the boss rush record too. So he's definitely kind of like a jack of all trades. I get you. But master of everything. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. uh, From everything I've seen, you know, like looking back on some of the, um, the older, the whatever leaderboards we have left of the Japanese runners, um, you'll see Chirapon at the top of almost every single one of them. Yeah, um, and I, I think it's also really cool, personally, that he a lot of the, the categories are kind of like divided up like among the, the players. So like some players will only do IL, some players will only do boss rush, and then some will only do any percent. And mm-hmm. Chirapon, I feel like, was the first one who was doing ILs to really get into the other categories like that. Mm-hmm. So it was really cool to see him kind of show what he's made of in, in the other categories as well. Nice. The other person that comes to mind is um, Unadon. Yeah, I, I Unidon. think it's Un- Unidone or something like that. I'm not something entirely like sure. I, I used to call him Unidone, but I'm not. I, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, but. Hmm. I would say he's probably the original like best player. So he was like the first like best player because there's been a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if there was like a Mount Rushmore, he would be the first one on there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, I believe uh, Unidon is the word for sea urchin because uh, every time I go to that web page um, and Google Translate, translates the names um the name just says sea urchin <laughs> <I'm> like oh <laughs> so and i even looked it up unidon sea urchin and it yeah, directs me to uh eating sea urchins and what uh what that looks like and gourmet sounds, dishes sounds fantastic there you go i like uh so unidon or unidon is like probably the player that comes to mind when i think of someone who is not very um not very willing to kind of like show off his runs mm-hmm. at least not to anyone outside of like the japanese community right tell uh, me about that yeah so there's one example in specific which we actually did eventually we were able to see uh how he did this but all the top times on the leaderboard for the first colossus the individual levels were probably about like uh, 20 seconds or so, like 19, 20 seconds. And Unidone had claimed to have had a 14 second ballast. And there have been a couple of, a couple of uh, Japanese runners who have said that, yeah, like we've seen like the screenshots and we've seen the video. And just recently we were actually able to, to watch the video. So it's, it's pretty crazy, but yeah, he didn't want people to steal uh, his videos and kind of, turn them into their own so yeah you had you had told me about this at some point and uh i think we talked about it i'll just briefly mention that that the that's such a a different mentality to what we have today which is it's interesting it's interesting what they were like back then right i mean in in a competitive sense it makes sense right we're like hey i got this time it's legit but like don't steal my strats i want to be number one you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure if, like, what the mindset was behind keeping it a secret outside of, like, he didn't want people, like, stealing his videos. But uh, it is definitely interesting that you can trace so many things back to Unidon, excuse me, even though he, even though he uh, was so private about his videos. Mm. I gotcha. All right. Well, that's all ancient history. I wanted to get it before we uh, before we really moved on. Um, so the new game comes out, and I guess did you jump on it pretty quickly? 
the 2018 yeah. version? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, like as soon as it came out. Nice. Uh, refresh memory. It came out in 2018 pretty early, right? Yeah, I believe February of 2018. Let me double check real quick. Okay, that's where like the first time show up is in February. So I assumed. Wasn't sure if it was like an embargo kind of thing or or not. Yeah, February 6th. Oh, man. Is when it yeah. came out. There was a while before the leaderboard was created, uh, just because we didn't know what the differences were going to be and if they were, if it was different enough to have its own leaderboard compared to yeah. the, the previous versions. So there's a lot of like really odd and hard to determine things when it came to getting its own leaderboard and if it's even worth it. Mm. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. I'm looking at the, so Shirapana is a 3721, right? So how quickly do you think it took before players were able to like get back to the level uh, that was in the old game, right? Because it's new. We got to learn the new stuff, right? Um, I think in particular, there's one Colossus that's uh, of quite a bit different, right? Yeah. Argus, um, I think his name is. Yeah, Argus was probably the biggest difference because it, we had to completely change the way that we did Argus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in the prior game, in the prior games, I should say, in both of them, we would do this trick where we would hop on Argus's leg right away and we would kind of crawl our way up to the upper leg and then we would jump onto his belt from the leg and we would kind of hang on the belt while he was walking until there was a certain like walking animation and we would kind of launch our way up to his stomach area or his, his chest from the belt so we called that the aptly named uh, belt launch <laughs> okay and uh the biggest difference is that from there we would go to the elbow of the arm in which he the, the sword is holding which which he's holding the sword i should say um and we would stab like a little minor sigil and it would make him drop the sword so that way you could just fall and get into his hand pretty easily but in the newest version you actually have to activate a cutscene of him breaking a bridge uh with that sword in order to be able to stab him in that area and get him to drop his sword so that G from before we kind of had to revamp and pretty much we had to find a way to get into his hand while he had the sword still in it. And gotcha. It's very, very finicky <laughs> to say the least. It looks really precise based on the footage I've seen. Yeah. If you're if you're no matter where you're jumping from, if you try to get into his hand, uh it's very, very hard to grab the right spot to do it. Gotcha. Okay. I see some other names in here that are taking the record, like uh, Zick and Foxy. Yeah. So, Can you tell me about them? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So Foxy and Zick, uh, they kind of came along a little bit after Plush had kind of like gotten his first run in or his first couple runs in and, and dipped. Uh, so Zick is actually like a very good Spyro runner. And I was kind of away from the game for a little bit. I had learned it just a little bit and then kind of taken a couple months break of a break. And then when I came back, I saw Zick had the record. I was like, whoa, who's this guy? And how did he get a, what is it, 38 something? Yeah. I was like, geez. Uh, so I'm assuming they just kind of showed up and took the strats and really like took the time to grind. Whereas I don't feel like anyone had really done that in the first few months of the game. Mm. Like, I think Plush was good enough just to get a solid time and then kind of disappear for a little bit. And then, uh, like I said, I think I was pretty much one of the only people, I think, that was active as well at the very, very beginning. Uh, but we obviously got more, like, the, the longer the game was out. But yeah. Okay. So Foxy and Zick came along, like couple months after the game's release and they really put in the time and, and the work to to whittle the time down nice 
Were they um, names that you had seen from the uh, the PS3 version at all, or were uh, they no. totally new? They are totally new. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. It's interesting think, how a new version brings so many new people. Right. And I think Foxy actually started playing when the new version came out, but he obviously was starting to peak and get better and better um, around that time. Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. sure when, when Zix started to run. Uh, I think it might have been like while I was on hiatus. Right. But it seemed like he learned the game pretty fast. I bet. On a couple of months. Yeah, I think Foxy would probably be able to tell you a little bit more about uh, about that period sure. in time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Immediately following after that, though, um, I think is uh, when did GDQ submissions open up? Because it looks like you and Grand Spaghetti have some sort of back and forth about who's going to be the one to run at GDQ. Yeah, so I think it would have been somewhere around like like July, maybe. Okay. July or sep- September maybe when the when the submission uh period went out. Mm-hmm. Uh so yeah, we when I came back to the game, I saw that there is another player who was actually like blitzing his way up the leaderboard. <laughs> his his name's Great Spaghetti and uh and I just remember like seeing his times improve and thinking like man, why am I not like putting in like as much time and effort? Like it would be so cool to see my name up there. So I just started kind of grinding too and, and trying to get more runs in. And at the time we were doing uh, RTA instead of in game time. Right. And so he had gotten a PS4, uh, sorry, not a PS4 pro, but it's just a PS4 with an SSD in it, which makes loading times faster, which means, uh, a lot of time cut off of of your RTA. So when he got that, <laughs> I ended up buying one for myself. And then yep. we kind of went through this era of of uh, being on equal footing and just hacking away at our own times. And it was it was a lot of fun. I made a really good friend out of it too. Nice. Yeah, you got to keep up. It's like, oh, he's got an SSD. I got to get an SSD too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was before we even made that bet too. We were both kind of just grinding and trying to get better before that even happened. Nice. Well, it's good they made friends out of it, you know. I, yeah. Some of my some of my best friends that I made in my life have been through speedrunning. Yeah, I still say that the, hanging out with Foxy and Spaghetti at that GDQ was like probably some of the most fun I've ever had. Hell yeah. God damn hell yeah, dude! I agree. Well, not not that in scenario in particular. <laughs> you were there too. Uh-huh. I was there. Yeah, I was. I was watching you from the binoculars. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, man, GDQ is so fucking fun. God damn, yeah, hanging out with all the homies. I miss GDQ. Yeah, I uh, plan on going back soon. Yeah, as soon as I can, man. As soon as I can. As soon as it opens back up in person, I'm I would be the first in line. Yeah, I need to get good at a game so I can <laughs> submit something. Nah, fuck it. Just go. <laughs> Just go to the marathon. <laughs> or you can submit. It's up to you. It's up to you. <laughs> All right. Anyways. <laughs> so, uh, let's see here. <laughs> you said uh, Plush went on like, a bit of a hiatus. He seemed to he got that first record initially and then he kind of disappeared. Um, he does show up again. Uh, there's no video. It looks like though. Yeah. I think that's like his only record that doesn't have a video. I'm not sure entirely what happened to it, but he did show up, uh, and start running again while, uh, while me and, uh, grand spaghetti were on the rise. And then I think he ended up taking the record from Foxy. And then, and then I took the record after that, and then Plush, I think, took it back. Mm-hmm. There's actually a really funny story. Let me see if I can remember this properly. But uh, so Grand Spaghetti had gotten like a world record time. Mm-hmm. But the funny thing is, 
plush had gotten a time like a faster time a couple days prior and didn't submit until like afterwards so i think i think spaghetti might have had the record for like literally a day but it was still unofficial uh or it still like wasn't even the record technically yeah. it was retroactively yeah. taken away <laughs> it was the record on the leaderboard but there was still like plush's run that was a little bit better that's a feels bad man yeah so all three of us actually i would even say all four of us were pretty close i don't think foxy was super active once he got the record uh just because that's kind of what tends to happen a lot of times Mm -hmm. for any game really but uh yeah he did make his way back eventually but that that period of time was was awesome where it was just all of us kind of trying to get the record or at least improve our own times This is right around the time where we switched to IGT, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the switch to IGT was probably my single greatest, uh, <laughs> my single greatest contribution to the community. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of upset with the whole situation about how like hardware differences can can kind of keep people from, I think, their position on the leaderboard and. Mm-hmm. There obviously anytime you don't have access to those kind of things and your time like should be better than the other times they're just not because of hardware differences it can be pretty frustrating i agree so i was wondering why we never used in game time and i think the universal answer that i got was just well we don't even know how it works <laughs> so that's kind of what i put on the, uh, the detective <laughs> hat because uh-huh. we wanted to figure out if, why it was so weird because we've done like very very brief testing before where we would kind of let like a like a timer run in the background of a run and then compare it with the the timer at the end the end game timer mm-hmm. and we would see if the differences made sense over you know a couple different runs that we timed that way and they didn't really make sense so that's why we never switched but I did a lot of research using the in-game timer because um, there's a section in the pause menu that shows you how long you've like been playing the game for. So what I would, what I did was I took aggro and I went on a nice little run for however long, like a minute or so, mm-hmm. and then I compared it to how much time I had gained from the in-game timer. And uh, over the course of like many trials, we found out that the in-game time runs at 10%, or I'm sorry, 90% of, of, uh, of real time. So it's 10% Whoa. slower than real time. Weird. Yeah. And uh, we also had to figure out where it was counting time to, because clearly there's a big difference between the RTA and the in-game time on the leaderboards. Right. And that's more than just uh, 90%. So a lot of it is uh, the timer doesn't run in cutscenes, but the timer runs. Um, the timer runs anytime you can move wander, even if it is like a cutscene that you can move wander in, which there's only like two or three of them. Right. So anytime you can actually physically move wander, the the in-game timer counts. Okay. Doesn't it slow down in the slow mo version when you do the final stab? <laughs> it does. And that's actually like part of a, the, like certain strategies. That's why uh, a lot of times when you finish with a jump stab, not only is it faster because it deals all the damage immediately without needing to charge, mm-hmm. it also cuts the timer off like immediately instead of doing a normal stab where the timer slows down and still keeps going. Interesting. But as far as in-game time with with uh, boss rush goes, or as far as boss rush goes with uh, in-game time. Mm-hmm. It's a lot different than any percent. The reason we didn't do it before was because I think we were kind of just lazy about it, honestly. And it felt pretty convoluted to have like a spreadsheet where we added up all the times and stuff like that. And uh, we also were like worried about splicing and pausing and stuff like that. Mm. But I think in the long run, it it ended up being a lot better because uh, we have this system where when you beat a Colossus, you put the time into a spreadsheet that will calculate all of your times 
and yeah. add them yeah add them all together so nice it makes it a lot more fair even though it might be a tad more work yeah and i think any time that you have access to an in-game timer if it's like worth a damn you know what i mean it's it's just a good idea to use it because it levels the playing field you know exactly especially, especially a, yeah i was just gonna say this <laughs> modern day and age where you can put whatever you want in your consoles and stuff like that you can put an ssd you could you know you have different kinds of ssds and mm-hmm. on pc it's even worse because there's you know all a million all parts yeah exactly all right as long as it's the same for everybody you know even if it is 90 percent of real time you know as long as it's the same on a ps pro as it is on a ps whatever regular four the regular ps4 so why not who cares it's the same exactly all right so that was your doing it's kind of funny that you uh you had this big push for it because i think uh there's a record here where it's like you guys you and plush came down to the wire and you beat him with igt but he beat you with rta yeah that was that i'm not gonna lie and say that wasn't a motivator to kind of like work out the in-game time thing Mm -hmm. but i will say that uh it it was unfortunate uh getting second place when your time was better uh, Mm -hmm. overall so but i feel like it was for the best anyways regardless (laughs) it just kind of stinks to be in the position where it looks like uh you're doing it because you just won first place or whatever Mm -hmm. you know there's there's you know you, you, you can look at it that way and be like oh man he's just salty he lost and he's just trying to worm his way into victory but at the same time like we've done this we've covered this kind of thing in um in a different video in the ranch and clank 2 video um there's a point when uh the two main people who are like have like this big rivalry and they they like legit hate each other for a little bit um they're going back and forth and like one guy there's like random times when the ps the ps3 i think would just take longer to load so you'd lose like seven seconds on certain load screens and um the like the annoying guy who was like yeah i'm gonna fucking beat all these guys times right i'm way too cool to like do this he uh came in and he got all these like short loads and he got the record and then this other guy scotto comes back and he gets the he actually has a better run but because he has more long loads he ends up losing and so he's like fuck this shit we're going to <laughs> we need to figure out how to remove long loads and so now the community removes long loads from every run just oh, wow. to level the playing field like that. So it's kind of like it's, you're motivated because obviously you just got ripped off, right? You had a better run and somehow you lost. But uh, at the same time, it, it makes it better for everybody in the long run. So you're justified. Yeah. We we all voted on it too. It wasn't like it was just me like, hey, we need to do this. And yeah. <laughs> it just happened. Like We did spend a lot of time working through it, talking about it before implementing it. And there was a... Uh, a vote on it well it's good democracy wins in the end yes all right okay so after that uh you're going on a a bit of a tear right next couple of months you get some good times in there right yes anything in particular just just the continual yeah it felt good to finally get the like the world record and um i think my favorite thing was getting that gdq submission in and actually running at gdq and then and then i think uh like the day after i got back from gdq i beat my previous pb so i i got another like world record again and uh just that feeling of continuously like besting yourself Mm -hmm. is is really nice even if it like even if it weren't the world record it's still really nice and i think it's really cool that uh, i was able to kind of stick with the game even after getting a world record because i don't really this is going to sound like cliche or whatever but i don't really play the game to get like a world record i just want to 
beat my previous time, really. So regardless mm-hmm. of if I have the record or not, uh, if I feel like I can beat my time or that my time isn't good enough or that I'm not happy with it, then then I'll just keep playing. I get it. It's good. I think um, a lot of people get kind of tied up. I, I have I have mixed feelings on this because we keep making videos about the world record, right? But at the same time, there's a huge culture around who has the world record, you know? And it's like, in, in a way, I think we should be more focused on, like, how do we, like, make the game faster and better and, like, more yes. accessible, you know? So whenever I play, I'm not, like, trying to get the record. I'm like, I want to I want to beat my time. Right? I don't care about anybody else's time. I want to beat my time, you know? So. Yeah, and I think that, um, I think it kind of like helps a lot in the long run too. I think eventually when I come back or if I come back, I should say um, a lot of people, when I mentioned wanting to come back, they're like, Oh yeah, you got to take down Sean or whatever. And to me, I'm just like, I just want to run that I could be really happy with using, you know, the modern techniques and stuff like that. So, Mm -hmm. and I, I also don't like that. There's a huge kind of culture around like, around like getting cheap and easy world records too like Mm -hmm. uh, we have we've had some people who have been wanting to add categories to the leaderboards that no one runs besides them or that no one wants to run besides them Mm -hmm. and i i feel like a lot of times it's just because they want you know they want to have that world record or whatever next to their name yep i have seen that many times many many times it's not my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. All right. Let's see here. Continuing on. Uh, let's see here. I think uh, around 20, right after that GDQ run, I think is roughly when you kind of take a step back, right? You got a couple of runs, you got a hot streak, and then sort of in January or so, I think you kind of take a break does that sound right yeah i think after like one or two records after after gdq which i got like relatively quickly because i was just kind of playing a lot Mm -hmm. um then i kind of kind of took a step back and um i think i i haven't really returned to the game in full force since then although i have gotten like a run or two in um or like a pb or two in but none of them have been really as active as I was at that point in time. I get you. Okay. All right. I think we're getting into some of these other things. Uh, tell me about the jump. Oh, the ump jump. D- did you say the ump jump? Yes, ump jump. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the ump jump was discovered by our runner Aiden Umfordson. And uh, Hence the name Ump Jump. Aha. Yeah. So on Quadratus, there is a tiny little tail that he has on the back. And beforehand, uh, we would shoot him in the bottom of the foot and go up either the front or the back leg mm-hmm. and kind of just kill the sigils pretty pretty normally. But for the ump jump, uh what Aiden had discovered is that if you shoot his back leg and he kind of dips his tail a little bit and if you jump at the right time and like off of like a pile of sand that that is left behind when quadratus falls over you can actually grab onto that tail and make it up to the back before you could on either the front or the back leg strategy Mm, okay and it saved a lot of time there nice okay i think uh it wasn't even I think two months later, the super jump. Let's see here. Did we talk about super jump yet? I think we haven't talked about super jump yet, but I think the super jump was before the ump jump, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just reading the document. Oh, really? Uh, as the super jump strategy became more common, even though it wasn't used in a world record NTA run yet, yeah, Wacky okay. Wolfo discovered the wacky jump. Aha, the wacky jump. Yeah, so we we did know uh, about the super jump because it was used in like the ILs, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we just didn't really start like trying to implement it into runs. I I actually knew about it um, going into the GDQ, I think, or even like that January. I knew it like existed and I knew it was possible to do, but I, first of all, I am not good at mashing at all and it requires a lot of mashing. <laughs> And second of all, my time could be improved a lot, even without it. So I was kind of in the at the point where I wanted to get really comfortable with with everything and being able to get a run with the current strategies that was good before I learned more. Gotcha. So yeah, the super jump. There's a pillar at the end of Cenobia's lair that you need to get on top of, and beforehand what we would have to do is we'd have to run to these set of stairs that are kind of close to that pillar and we have to jump off those stairs and and grab onto like a little arch thing it's like part of the architecture in the area right and then we'd, we'd have to jump from that back onto like a temple looking thing and then jump from the temple looking thing onto the pillar so there's like kind of like a lot of steps there that was called the kaze jump because uh Bobby Kaze figured it out. All right. But the super jump, instead of doing all that, we just run up to the pillar and you can kind of clip into it if you jump jump at the right angle at the right spot. You can kind of clip into the pillar. So when you're mashing the jump button, uh it kind of like shoots you upwards a lot higher than you normally would go uh when mm -hmm. you would do a jump. Gotcha. Yeah, it allows you to grab onto the. Actually, it could launch you in very different heights, but it, it allows you to grab onto the pillar. So gotcha. Okay. And what is this wacky jump? How what is that? Uh, I haven't actually seen any footage of this. I don't think. <laughs> so the the wacky jump uh, is actually pretty much immediately after you get the super jump. Mm -hmm. So. When you get on top of the pillar, Cenobia will run into the pillar twice, and on the second time, the pillar will fall over, and it'll collapse the wall that's right next to you. Mm -hmm. And you need that wall to collapse in order to get to the next section of the fight. And you can actually move in that cutscene where the wall is collapsing. So while the pillar is falling down, we would jump off the pillar into that area. Gotcha. And we would blindly make our way to kind of where we needed to stand to get ready for the next part. Uh, but Wacky Wolf found out that you can actually jump to a part of the cliff that's in that area that's kind of like sticking out, and you can jump on that part of the cliff and then jump up to the to the like the gazebo or like plateau area where you need to get to immediately. So mm -hmm. it kind of it skips probably another five to ten seconds. Oh, there you go. That's pretty good. Yeah, and actually, if you, you could probably, if I were to show you later, you could probably see the difference. But it's, it's really hard to see yourself during that. Like the the setup for it is pretty much completely blind. You just kind of have to go off of like muscle memory, mm -hmm. and so it it's pretty difficult. But at the same time, it's as long as you kind of get that figured out, it's not too bad. I get you. Okay. Uh, and I'm seeing that uh, Foxy would be the, like the first person to get the sub 17 with that 1649. It's a pretty big improvement over previous runs. Yeah, Foxy put in a lot of effort uh, after I kind of stepped away from the game. I think he was the one to really like take the gauntlet and start running for uh, with it. Mm -hmm. it. It seems like there's a lot of time where just one person is running the game at like a really high level while everyone else is kind of taking like a back seat or not as active. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that seems to kind of be like a pretty common occurrence with this game because like one person will put in a lot of time and effort, get that world record, maybe go for another run or two and step away for a bit. Um, and I think this is just kind of another one of those times where Foxy was the one to, to take back the uh, the crown. He was on point. It was his turn. Yep. Even though he already had a turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he can get he can get back in line to get another turn later on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
Um, let's see here. Uh, I don't want to skip over Hammer. Um, he seems to have a pretty short time in the limelight. He's a, I think you mentioned he's an IL runner, right? Like a mainly an IL guy. Yeah, we, um, Hammer is probably one of the coolest runners, I guess, or one of like the, one of the coolest cases because he's an IL runner and he actually took the time and effort to really take those ILs, which were pretty inconsistent and get them about as consistent as you can be at them. I won't say like there's a huge, like, you know, there's like a high success rate on them, but he wasn't scared to do runs with those, even even though his success rate with them uh, was higher than everyone else's. They were still really difficult. Mm -hmm. So like the, uh, the Avion like jump stab on the wing, he was like the first one to do start doing that and runs in this game. They had been done in previous games by Shirapon, but in this version of the game, he was like the first one to really start going for those. Gotcha. I see a bunch of other little things here too. Yeah, like the Gaius IL, I think he was doing, uh, which is like very, very difficult. He was doing, um, I can't remember any of the other ones that he was doing, but he was just really good at, at those strategies even though even though they're still very hard. Mm-hmm. So last but not least is Inception Sean. Right? Mm-hmm. Inception. Um and uh, we'll we'll get more into him in a minute. But uh so Hammer is this big IL guy and then he doesn't want to get that many more records after that. I don't think he does get any. Um but did that change like the 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 runners mentality like did everybody else try to adopt that kind of those strats or um did a lot of people kind of go back to to doing the way they had been doing so i would say yeah a lot of people were way more uh considerate in regards to using il strats uh i think shortly after foxy started like trying to learn how to do the jump stab on the avion's wing and i even put a lot of time into that um i started actually trying to do il strats just in general just to like kind of get a feel for them and if i could make them consistent like i remember one stream i was probably streaming for like an hour and a half two hours of just doing the same il over and over and over and over again uh, i was doing analysis and was trying to see if i could do it and make it consistent, but unfortunately I was not able <laughs> to figure out a way. But a lot of people definitely considered using IL strats or at least practicing them enough to try to use them in runs. Mm-hmm. I think this time period actually too was probably the most active, or at least like maybe right afterwards. Cause at this point in time I was I think I came back to running the game at least a little bit. I didn't I don't think I got really any PBs. If I did, it wasn't a major one. Right. Um and I never got the record back, but I do remember playing a little bit at this point in time. And then Tic Tac was pretty much like done with his come up. Like he was already at this point he was pretty much like one of the best runners of the game and he was running. Hammer was running Foxy. So at this point in time, Aiden was running too. We had pretty pretty good competition. And then once Sean and, and JK came along, that's when like everyone was playing. I get it. What um what was that like seeing seeing like all these people playing? Because you know, you mentioned in the past that a lot of times it feels like there's only one person playing. But now all of a sudden it's a cacophony of people. You'd have, you know, half a dozen names you just listed. People were all playing the game. People old and new are all jumping in. What was that like? It was honestly really, really awesome because for someone who's played the game for so long, it's seeing like people come and go in waves was pretty frustrating because the game I think is such a fun speed run. Uh so just to see people like Ruby and Tic Tac and JK and Sean come in and play and uh Asimov started doing started doing uh boss rush again and 
so just like seeing all these people get good at the game at around the same time was was really awesome. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Um tell me a bit about Tic Tac. I mean, we kind of mentioned that um well he that he was wacky wolf at the time. I think he changed to Tic Tac, right? It's the same person? No, actually who, who am I thinking of? <laughs> uh I'm not sure. Tic Tac has always been Tic Tac. Uh um, Okay. Yeah, wacky was another community member. Okay, ignore me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Why did oh, I that's think so that? <laughs> <laughs> You, you might want to cut this next part from the record, but they were dating at the time. Ooh. Yeah. Hold on, we'll leave that off the table. But, you know. Yeah. Oh, you know what? In the in the document, it says Tic Tac slash Wacky Wolf. Yeah, uh, they, they were together a lot, so. Gotcha. Okay. I think I just conflated it with, like, oh, Church and Gooperman, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get you. Okay. All right. Anyways, so um, Tic Tac. Tell me about Tic Tac. What's Tic Tac like as a as a runner? Tic Tac is probably one of the like most hardworking runners I've ever seen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just love how dedicated he is to playing the game and and getting better. Um, I think he like he didn't have as fast of like a meteoric rise as like as foxy myself or like sean but uh just like the sheer amount of work he put in really like kind of over overcame that that obstacle and uh it's i don't know it's just really cool to see to see someone work that hard and get rewarded by by having a top time (laughs) he's also an amazing mentor he has done a lot of like sessions where he's taught newer players and he's probably the best like beginner helper there is he's made a giant guide of beginner strategies and how to execute them and resources and stuff like that so he's definitely probably he's definitely like the most helpful player awesome glad to hear it yeah also amazing (laughs) hell yeah all right. And then last but not least, we have one one more person to talk more about. And then we'll I'll let you go. It's getting a little late. Mm-hmm. We have to talk about Inception. Sean, the legend. Yeah, there's a there's too many things to say about Sean. <laughs> he is oh, way yeah. too good at this game. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say let's start let's start listing them and start with how somehow he is the only person to take this you know so far. I don't know how anyone else. I don't know why he has over a minute faster than anybody else. So the biggest thing I can say is that consistency is key in this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if any of the runners behind Sean, like any of like the five or six runners behind Sean's time were to like were to actually be like consistent on a run and get like all the strategy like all 16 strategies, like they would be right up there with Sean. And so mm-hmm. I think that's what makes Sean so good is that uh he's just so consistent at a game that's feels like it's impossible to be consistent. Mm. Because this is, I I don't watch like a ton of speedruns, but I can say that this is probably the most punishing like speedrun I've just about ever seen. Elaborate on that. Yeah. So if you mess up even just slightly uh, on probably like half to seventy five percent of the the colossi, you could lose like. 30 seconds to a minute to like even like a minute and a half just from like one small error or your run could even just end like right there so um and there's like 16 of these guys <laughs> so yeah, no being kidding. that consistent at all of them and just being able to get all of them in a perfect run is it felt impossible honestly <laughs> i don't think any of my record runs had had um 
I don't think any of my runs had no retries. So in in any or not in any percent, I'm sorry, in boss rush, if you mess up a strategy and it's close to like the beginning of the of the trial, you can like just retry mm -hmm. the, the time trial. And so even in like my world record runs, like there were still re like retries and second attempts on some of these colossi. Like I would have never have dreamed of getting like all of them in one run, just about as good as you can get them, which I think Sean at this point has. I see. I see. So that's the biggest difference. I don't necessarily think Sean is like leaps and bounds above anyone in terms of like being able to like execute said strategies or or like like learning them um learning strategies that like no one else can do or whatever mm -hmm. it's it's more or less just he's incredibly consistent i get you i also hear he has like a bit of like a no reset mentality of like we're just going to make sure all these runs are going to get to the end yeah, so <laughs> it's actually funny. Tic Tac and Sean are the complete opposites in this regard. Uh, Tic Tac could still absolutely PB in a lot of his runs, but he'll just reset because he's like, oh, well, that sucked. <laughs> and Sean is like, yeah, I can't PB with this, but I should probably still finish the run because it'll kind of help my mentality for when I get to this spot in a different run. Or it just means I practice this Colossus a little bit more kind of thing. I get you. I think, if I might say, I think uh, doing more runs, I mean, completing more runs means that, like, you have more opportunities to get the good run, right? To get a run that saves time and, like, in PBs. Um, I'm trying to think. It feels like a silly thing to say, but it's like when you actually, when you actually play the run to the end, more runs are going to PB than you think. You know, it doesn't look like it, but you're going to get more runs done. And getting more runs done means that when the right run happens, you're going to be more prepared to get it done because you've been there. You just keep going. Exactly. You know. I get you. Okay. Sure. Good. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say there's also like a lot of strategies uh, since Sean has been running that have kind of come to light that. A lot of people have like tried implementing and kind of like half succeeded, whereas Sean is is just so consistent that once he picks it up, he kind of just has it and he can do it. Um, okay. So like uh, the ump jump, for example, I think was started started to be implemented after he started running. I think if I remember correctly, and if it okay. wasn't, it was around that time. But he he was able to like learn that really easily. Just kind of, just kind of, uh, always have it consistent. Whereas other people, especially myself, I am not very good at the strategy. Uh, we're not as consistent at it, at it, in learning it. So, and I think a big gap right now too is that uh, he's he's just like learned all those strategies, and a lot of people have kind of taken their time on doing that. All right. So, sort of wrapping up here. Uh, it's always interesting to sort of look at where we are and where can we go from here. You know, like what, what do you see for the future of Shadow of the Colossus speedruns? So the cool thing about the Shadow of the Colossus speedrun community, especially now, is that we are also invested in the other two games. Uh, beforehand, our Discord server was basically just a Shadow of the Colossus speedrun server instead of a Team Ico one. We had the other games there, but no one ran it. Uh, but we've had a couple people come in and start running the other games, and so now, now everyone is kind of like getting their feet wet in the other games as well. Mm -hmm. So I think for right now, it might be a little bit of a slow period, considering that other people are running other games uh, from from Team Ico. Right. But I do see a lot of people continuing to run the game and uh, hopefully 
here pretty soon once I get settled in at my new place. Uh, I'll be one of those people coming back. Hell yeah, brother. I want to see it. I want to see church. Cooper man, number one. No. Like I said earlier, I don't know about number one. But if I can learn these strategies and implement them and be happy with my time, then I know I'm that's all playing. that matters. <laughs> I'd love to see you come back though. Return to the king. Um I also forgot to mention during the time where everyone was running the game, including Sean. Like at this point there was Sean, JK. Uh, Tic Tac, myself, Foxy, Mm -hmm. Aiden, and uh, Azuma. We were all like running the game pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think around this time is when I kind of offered up a bounty for whoever could get sub 16. Oh, yeah. Tell me about that. What's what spurned you on to see to do that? This was around the time where I think that Easyscape made like a bounty video, and bounties have always been a thing. But mm-hmm. uh, I remember reading on the subreddit that there was like bounties for different games, and I think the the Wind Waker like barrier skip didn't that have a, a bounty on it too, or something like that. Yeah, I just remember there being a lot of bounties, and I was thinking, well, what would be a good goal to set for a kind of like a bounty in this game? And I thought, hey, sub sixteen, uh, we have sub seventeens now, but a lot of people are running, and we're pretty close to sub. 16 and maybe if i kind of throw some money in the pot more people will be willing to really put in the the grind Mm -hmm. so that's kind of the inspiration behind that and i did one for any percent too if whoever could get a sub one hour in game time nice all right um i think at some point we had mentioned that uh, any percent, any percent is a little less like it's mostly like innovations in any percent are just innovations in boss rush, but like implemented in the full game. That sound about right. At the very start of the game, that's how it was. Um, I'm sorry. Could you could you ask that question again? I didn't really. Sure. Yeah. Um, I I what I mainly want to just sort of cover is. You know, any percent is a totally different category, but I think any percent is a, is similar to boss rush in that the whole game is just a boss rush, but you cut out all the, like the running and like the the horse ride riding back and forth. So I don't really know. I guess I'm just trying to get confirmation that do we need to talk about any percent a whole lot or because you mentioned you made it a bounty for any percent. Like is any percent like a big category? Oh, uh. It's relative. It's it's like decent size. It's I don't think it's as big as Boss Rush, but it's just about as big. But then again, I think there's a lot of overlap between any percent and and uh, and Boss Rush. I do think maybe something that's important was uh, mentioning Distortion Two at the very oh, yeah. beginning of the game's lifespan, at least the 2018 version. Mm-hmm. Distortion Two would put a lot of time into figuring out strategies for this new version of the game that didn't exist in the old version, or uh, at least slight changes that needed to be adjusted. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, Distortion uh, put in a lot of work, and he was mainly he was only an any percent runner, so that's why maybe um, seeing a couple like the Argus thing, <laughs> the the initial Argus strategy for this version of the game was way harder than it is now, in my opinion, and it's way more risky. But he was the first one to find it, and he was doing it at 90%. There you go. Shout-outs to Distortion. Yeah. Um, How specific, like, how in-depth do you get with, like, strategies in in your videos? That's a good question. This one feels like a video where we can really kind of dive in um, because, you know, there's only 16 levels. You know what I mean? There's mm-hmm. only 16, like, I mean, I, it's funny to call them, call them levels, but they're it's 16 <laughs> boss fights. It's levels. the entire game. Yeah, it's the entire yeah. game. It's 16 boss fights, you know? Like, you know, if we didn't go deep into strategy, right? It feels it would it would feel disingenuous. It's like, what are we talking about here? This is the perfect opportunity to talk about, um, to go really in depth because 
I think by the end of it, all of the viewers should be pretty familiar with how every single one of these fights goes. You know? Yeah, that'd be cool because something like Argus is like really interesting because it started off with like the belt launch and then and then there's the strategy that Distortion discovered, um, which we knew about in the PS2 version because the PS2 version has different um, has different physics in the PS3 version, and we couldn't do it in the PS3 version. But once we tried it in this version, it worked because the physics are more close to the uh, the PS2 version. So mm-hmm. it's it's a whole lot of chaos there. But yeah, <laughs> so we figured out that we could do that leg launch uh, that we do on that Colossus where we jump to his like chest or head from the knee. Uh, I don't know. How, have you seen what we do for that strategy? Like, have you, have you watched uh, Argus's strategy? I've like, seen some runs. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the, the, the knee launch. I remember the hand stabbing thing and that. Much, yeah. But... So we, we, what we do now is we get onto the leg and then like jump directly to the leg or from the leg to the hand. Mm -hmm. And we stab the inside of the hand, and then we jump back to the leg. And when Argus starts walking, we use his animation from when he's lifting his leg up to launch ourselves from the leg all the way up to the to the head. Gotcha. But what distortion distortion uh, didn't do that first, (laughs) or he didn't do that second. I mean, Uh, he did it immediately. So he got on the leg and launched up to the head. And then once he finished the head sigil, because now we do the head sigil last, but when he did it, he did the head sigil first and then dropped down to his like chest area. And he did like a certain animation where he tried to shake you off. And as mm-hmm. soon as that started, you would drop all the way to the ground. And then he would like just be kind of waiting there for the animation to kind of end where he pulls his hand back and he would jump from the ground into the back of his hand. And so it was a lot different from what we do now, and it was a lot more difficult, if you ask me. But it's kind of cool how we figured out, like, hey, why are we, why are we losing runs to this when we could just try to get into his hand first? So there you go. So just stuff Innovation. like that, I think, is like really cool, and I think would be really cool to cover. Absolutely, absolutely. In the time that you were talking about that, I found uh, I looked up Sean's video, and then I found Argus, Argus, and then I, I watched him do the knee launch to the head, which was pretty nuts. Yeah, so we used to do that first. <laughs> like, if you watch Distortion's, like, world record run, I think, or D- Distortion's, like, uh, run on the leaderboard, I think, he, yeah. I think he does, like, the really difficult to do strategy because, yeah, he messes it up a bunch, too. Okay, maybe that's not a good indication, but he tries it and fails it. So, yeah, I get you. All right. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you're like, this video would not be complete if we didn't talk about this? Mm-hmm. Which I know is a very vague question, but right. uh, I don't know. I always like asking just just in case, just in case, because it's like there's always going to be like something that falls between the cracks. But uh, I don't know. Sometimes it's like I I don't know what I don't know. So it's hard for me to ask questions for things that I don't really know what I'm missing. Right. I understand. Um, I would say. Just like the like initial wave of strategies from like the PS2 version, like when it first released, and just how quickly the Japanese scene w- was able to find like the strategies that we still use today, even if they are kind of edited or revised. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just crazy how well they were able to find those things back then and. And um, even though they didn't do full game runs and they only did ILs, they shaped the way that we do boss rush today. Absolutely. It's going to be a big topic that I want to talk about in the video. So I, I think that that sort of idea of like these guys found all the optimal strategies 
so much so that a lot of these are like essentially the exact same strats we use today. Yeah. Or, and, well, not um, exact, but yeah. I think it's also really cool how how dedicated like they were to putting in like the effort because a, a lot of games will come out um and you know people might try to like run them for a little bit and then they kind of just die off or whatever but mm-hmm. shadow of the colossus has been around for <laughs> for uh let's see here like 16 years now yeah something like that yeah 16 years it came out in 2005 um it's just insane to think that there are there are people super dedicated within the first couple months of the game's release, and that there are still just like people dedicated to to the game. Where usually, like with those older games, like that's not really like a big thing. I think, at least from like from like two thousand and five, right? Where like a game will come, like their speedrunning wasn't like that big back then, right? Yeah. At least I wouldn't not, imagine. Not then, yeah. It was but very have, niche. But they have so many people from Japan just, like, grinding. And then uh, Brazil and South America eventually uh, kind of caught on, too. And I think the games like Prestige as, like, you know, this game that's unlike any others. It's kind of, like, another reason why. Because it's such a classic. And, yeah. Absolutely. Having time trials also like really helps. Like the, if the game didn't have time trials, oh, I don't absolutely. think we would be as big as we are now. Yeah, that's the, the craziest thing is that uh, games with built-in time trials, like that's just that's the perfect territory for for speedruns, especially in an era before um, timers and things like that. It's like yeah, a couple people did speedruns of Zelda games, but like. Nah, man, you don't get it. People, people grinded time trials. Yeah, you know, even like Mario Kart, even Mario Kart back in the day. You know that game had time trials because it had a built-in timer. It had a huge community back in the day. Yeah, we we would not be even close to where we'd be at today if uh, Ueda didn't didn't include like a time trial, which is very interesting for this kind of game too, where it's like a really sentimental game and it's a mm-hmm. sentimental game and it's not like it's one of those emotional games, right? That in like a one in a lifetime kind of game, it's not like a, like a cart racer, or you know, yeah. Or like another Zelda game. Like this is like, this game doesn't happen <laughs> more than once. Mm-hmm. So the fact that Ueda was just like, yeah, let's put it in a time trial. Let's see how fast, like let's, let's put it in a challenge mode for how fast people can beat these. Mm-hmm. So I just think that's a pretty, pretty cool coincidence or, Pretty cool, uh, pretty cool happening. A decision that changed history. <laughs> well, yeah, our history. <laughs> <laughs> hey, still, it's someone's life changing. Not many lives, but you know, some lives. Yeah, it changed <laughs> mine, that's for sure. Hell yeah. All right. I think that's all that I have for you. Cool, cool. Alrighty, so thank you so much for chatting with me. Let's go ahead and end this recording here.